I'm Anne Marie from Brambleberry.com. And today's video, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about how to make cold process soap from scratch. So before we dive into the actual soap making process, I'm going to talk a little bit about safety and science. And if you want to hop around in this video, we're putting timestamps into the video so you can actually just figure out where and what you're most interested in and go right there. There's also a playlist down below that you can use to delve into any of these topics in the video even more. If you're just getting started on your cold process journey, please make sure you like this video, give it a thumbs up, and of course, subscribe to this channel so you're notified every single time we come out with a new video. So what is cold process soap? Cold process soap is simply the product that comes out of combining oil and sodium hydroxide and water. Water is used as the sodium hydroxide kind of mixer. When the sodium hydroxide or the lye mix with the oils, it starts a process called saponification. And saponification is just a fancy way of saying turning the oils and the lye water into soap. On its own, sodium hydroxide is an inorganic compound that always needs to be handled with care. It actually is super caustic if it gets onto the skin, and when it mixes with water, it can create fumes that are pretty irritating to uh, like your mucous membranes or any children or pets in the area. But like any dangerous thing, once you know how to handle it safely, it's totally okay to use. Many beginners are surprised that you need to use lye with every kind of soap out there. That's right, everything that is actual true soap started with lye at one point. The lye kicks off that saponification process, that making of the soap process. But not to worry, a well-balanced bar of soap won't have any lye in the final product. So why hand make cold process soap? Well, if you look at regular bars of soap that you buy at the store, many of them have like really long ingredient lists where you have lots of unpronounceable names. And just because something's unpronounceable doesn't make it bad, but these are just really chemicals that have been shoved together to make something that approximates what you think or the consumer thinks is an actual bar of soap, right? Some lather, lather must be good. And you're like, but I don't understand what's in here. Handmade soap that you make from scratch actually has all those beautiful ingredients where you know exactly where the product was sourced and you know exactly what it's going to do on your skin. Simply put, it's better for your skin and better for the environment. Making cold process soap is so fun and so rewarding. And yes, it's very creative. You can customize your ingredients. You can customize your colors. You can customize your molds. You can customize so much about the soap and really turn it into something that reflects you. At Brambleberry, we believe everyone is creative and soap making is a fantastic way to showcase that. And when you're done, you have beautiful usable art, essentially, that you can use for yourself, give away, or yes, even start a small business. So now that we know what cold process soap is, let's talk about what you need to get started. The ingredients. As I mentioned before, so cold process soap is made by combining sodium hydroxide or lye with water and oil. So about the lye, you always wanna make sure you get sodium hydroxide, not potassium hydroxide. And you wanna make sure that wherever you're buying it from is 100% pure. It's really uh, tempting to buy sodium hydroxide or lye from the hardware store because sometimes it's used for cleaning drains. But you know what? The stuff that's used for cleaning drains usually has extra additives in it. So you need 100% pure sodium hydroxide. So make sure you're buying it from a reputable source that ships it in double sealed containers and also that are airtight. You don't want to store your lye in, say, like a plastic bag. So in order to make the lye, which is a flake form or it can be a pellet form, get into your actual oils, you first have to dissolve it in water. So a word about your water. You want to always use distilled water when you're making your soap. This is because the water that comes from the tap, whether it's well water or treated city water, can often have little tiny minute impurities that you wouldn't expect. And in fact, if it's an old piping system, sometimes the metal from the pipe comes off and that will cause your soap to go bad faster. So when you're making soap, the most popular choice is yes, water, and it is the one for beginners, but other people do use fruit juices, aloe vera, milk is a really popular liquid, whether it's nut or animal milk, all of those are liquids you can totally use as a carrier to dissolve your sodium hydroxide in. The third basic ingredient is your oils, and there is a wide range of soap making oils available for you to use, to combine, to get the perfect hardness, the perfect lather, and the perfect conditioning for your preferences. 
While it is possible to make soap with just one oil, Castile soap, for example, is just 100% olive oil, that usually doesn't work great, and you want a combination of oils to get the perfect balance for what you're looking for. Learn more about choosing your oils in our Formulating Cold Process Soap Recipes video. So, once you have your lye, your oils, and your water, everything else is the fun stuff. The colorants, the fragrances, and the, yes, the mold. But you have everything you need right here to make cold process soap. So, let's talk about what tools you need to make cold process soap. The first and foremost and most important thing is your safety gear. So. That means goggles to protect your eyes. And I know it's really tempting to say, I wear eyeglasses, that's enough. It's not enough. You actually want something that's gonna give you a full coverage. You only get one set of eyes. So let's not mess around with that. Gloves, because you wanna protect your delicate skin from getting any sort of lye burns. And of course, you wanna wear a long sleeve, long pants, closed toed shoes, and make sure that all the kids and pets are in another area and that you're in a well ventilated room. To learn more information about lye safety, especially if you're feeling a little nervous about it, we do have an in-depth lye safety video. The link is down below. So next up is the heat safe container to mix your lye water in, your actual large bowl that you're going to use to make your soap, stirring utensils, and a stick blender. Now, you can mix by hand. You could, some people use egg beaters and some people just use like a whisk. And I will tell you from experience, because I, back when I was 14, I mixed by hand with a whisk. It literally takes hours, like three to five hours. So a stick blender is a really good investment in your time and your sanity and to get a really good finished bar of soap. A few other handy things is a thermometer, so you can check the temperature of your lye water and your oils, a scale to measure everything precisely. Soap making is not done by volume, it's done by weight. And a whisk is really useful, some extra spoons are really useful, and of course spatulas so you can scrape the side of the bowl down to get every last little bit of drop of soap is also really good to have on hand. The final thing you need is a mold. Now, my favorite to use is a silicone mold. They're pretty inexpensive. You can reuse them over and over again and the soap releases pretty easily. You can also use a wooden mold and with a wooden mold, if you're not using a silicone liner, you'll want to make sure that you are lining it with a parchment paper to ensure that the soap doesn't stick to the wood. Other inexpensive things to use, you could use a box lined with uh, parchment paper and you can use Tupperware. There's a couple things to think about if you're choosing an item to use as a mold from your house and you don't have a soap mold on hand. One, does it have give, right? Can you bend it? Will the soap actually come out of it easily? So that means no glass containers or say terracotta pots, for example. A second thing to think about is what is the material made out of? You cannot use aluminum. When aluminum and sodium hydroxide get together, they actually make a noxious or toxic explosive gas. So no aluminum utensils to stir your product with and no aluminum molds to pour your soap into. I just gave you some very basic tools. Once you really get into soap making and you're gonna really get into soap making, it is so fun. There is lots of other tools that you can buy to enhance your soap making experience. Everything from scraping tools to make cool designs to these cool wire things to make really interesting swirly de loops inside your soap. So many cool tools, so many other things to play with, but the ones I just went over are the basics for making cold process soap your very first time. Now that we have our ingredients and now that we have all of our equipment, it's time to prep our area. So what does that mean? Well, I'm working on a, a surface that I picked specifically for soap making. It is non-porous and chemicals don't, re like it's chemical resistant. If you are working on a wooden countertop or a delicate marble countertop, make sure you are covering your entire surface with cardboard or a, like newspaper. So that way you keep and protect your gentle and delicate surfaces. Another important part of prepping your area is to make sure you actually have enough time to make soap. So the least amount of time you're gonna need is 30 minutes, and quite frankly, that's pretty fast to like set up and clean up. So give yourself 30 to 60 minutes for your batch of soap. And finally, make sure you're working in a well-ventilated area with plenty of airflow. Many soap makers really find the fumes from sodium hydroxide to be very irritating to mucous membranes, their nose, and their lungs, and so they'll actually wear a full face mask. 
totally up to you, total personal preference. I soap in a well-ventilated area, and so I just soap with my eyeglasses on or my safety goggles on and my gloves. And I already said it once, but I'm gonna say it again because it is so important. Soap without pets around, I mean, a, a cat jumping into a fresh thing of soap, not good, right? And soap without children around, like a tiny little hand reaching up to see exactly what's going on up here because your soap batter looks a lot like frosting or cake batter, not good. So just make sure that there's no children, no pets around, and you are good to soap. Now that we have our area prepped, it's time to prep our ingredients. So what that means is that, first of all, I like to prep my lye water first. That's because it needs time to cool down before you turn it into soap. It means you get your safety gear on. And every single thing that we're about to do, we have so many more videos on this channel that show you how to do each and every one of these things in depth. So make sure you're clicking on the resources below to see any of those extra videos, especially for example, our how to use lie safely video. So I have my water already measured over here and now it's time to measure out my lie. I'm gonna use a separate container. Why is this? Well, if I'm pouring directly into here, I can't take the lye out. So say I pour too much, then I, what am I gonna do with too much lye in my lye water? So I always use a separate container to double weigh that lye because it's so important to get the lye proportion of your recipe correct. Now I'm going to slowly pour my lye into the water, stirring a little bit each and every time. You'll notice that the lye water starts to turn cloudy. This is totally normal. At some point, very shortly, you'll also start to potentially see a little bit of steam rising to the kind of top of the mixing container. This is because it's starting to get very hot. The lye water actually gets to be 180 to 200 degrees. One of the ways you know you have bad lye is if your lye water doesn't get hot enough, actually. So now this is getting nice and warm. We're starting to fog up here, which means, of course, there is fumes that are drifting up, which is why it's so important to work in that well-ventilated area. One incredibly important safety component is you always want to add your lye to your water, never your water to your lye. And think about what happens. If you had your lye down here and you added the water to it, it has the ability to make a big chemical reaction all at once and a big volcano of heat can erupt up and literally erupt out, burning you, burning surfaces, and that's the last thing you want. So always add your lye to your water, never your water to your lye. And once this is fully mixed in, you can just set it to the side and then wait for it to cool down. This is just your classic combination of coconut oil, palm oil, and olive oil, and that's what I'm gonna use to make a really great basic cold process soap recipe. I do notice it's a little cloudy, which is a sign to me that this is just a little cold. So I'm gonna to work to bring this up to the correct temperature. I'm just gonna microwave this for about 30 seconds to 45 seconds. And if you're interested in learning more about how to formulate your cold process soap recipe, we do have a how to formulate cold process soap that talks all about the different kinds of oils that you can use and why you would use them. The link will be down below. While your oils and lye are cooling, go ahead and prep all your ingredients. In this case, I just am gonna use some green iron oxide. And when you're using a powdered color, you just pre-mix it with a little bit of oil to make sure that it removes any lumps. So this is just one teaspoon of colorant in one tablespoon of oil, just mixing it with a little mini mixer. The last thing to measure out is my fragrance oil. Fragrance oils, Definitely, just like your regular oils, need to be weighed out and not use volume. It's tempting to eyeball them, but you want your fragrance to be strong enough and also safe. When you are buying your fragrances, something to keep in mind is they need to actually be safe for use in soap and body products. So that means no potpourri, um, no just candle fragrances. And so like at brambleberry.com, for example, we do have a fragrance calculator so you know what the minimum to use and the maximum you can safely use in your soap products is. Okay, now that our area is prepped and we have our fragrance and we have our colors and these are the correct temperature, now we get to make soap. Da -da -da -da. Here's our light water, here's our oils. We pour gently down the shaft of our little, whatever we're pouring onto, whether it's a stick blender or in this case, I'm just using a spatula. And the reason we do that is when you pour too quickly, you get a lot of air bubbles in the soap. And the air bubbles aren't that big of a deal, but I don't like the way they look when you cut them. 
I'm gonna just put this in the sink right now and rinse it out because I don't want an empty container with just a little bit of lye water sitting around just in case. So, so now I'm just sort of, I, this is just me messing around. Um, I'm just mixing everything together with my spatula and then I'm gonna stick blender it. So when you put your stick blender in, you just pop it to the bottom, you burp it. That's right, because air gets trapped under the bulb and, and you don't wanna put in a lot of air bubbles in here. And so then you turn your stick blender on and right away you can start to see the soap is emulsifying. And emulsifying is just a fancy way to say the oil and water are mixing together. As you stick blend, you're going to notice that this texture is gonna to start to change. It's going to become thicker and of course get whiter, more white. And this is called trace. You can have thin trace or medium trace or thick trace. And you know what? We've got an entire video about that. It's called All About Trace. So make sure to watch that to learn more about what you're looking for in the soap making process. Usually you just need to stick blend for eh, 30 to 60 seconds. On average, this is gonna be kind of what your texture is going to be. I have a very thin trace. I'm soaping in a very hot environment right now and that definitely affects trace. So I have a very thin trace, but it is a real trace. It is, however, so thin that I won't be able to do like any cool textures on top, which is fine. For this beginner soap, having a flat bar of soap that's just a normal rectangle is just fine. Once you have a consistency of like a cake batter, then you know you're at a solid kind of thin, ah, medium trace, and then it's time to add our color and our fragrance. I usually add my color first, just in case the fragrance does anything like accelerate trace, which is a fancy way of make, saying that your soap gets thicker faster. I'm just gonna go ahead and eyeball this now. And so what you see when you're working with oxides is what you get. So I'm just gonna see how I like this. Once it starts to mix in, I'm hand mixing now because I'm at a pretty decent trace and I don't really want this trace to get much thicker. It's a beautiful pale green and that's kind of perfect for our fragrance because we chose the rejuvenating eucalyptus fragrance and you know what? I can't ever leave well enough alone. I'm just gonna add a little bit more green and hand stir that in. And then I'm gonna add my fragrance and I'll hand stir that fragrance in as well. But I wanna make sure my green is mostly mixed in before I pour because any kind of streaks of oxide can lead to bubbles that lather colors because you end up with the oxide not being really fully mixed into the soap. So this is just beautiful. I love that. Now I'm gonna add my pre-measured fragrance. And now I'm just adding slowly while hand stirring. You'll notice that there's liquid floating at the surface. This is totally normal, it's because you know what? There's liquid floating at the surface. You just have to slowly work in that fragrance. Now, at this point in the soap making process, I'm so thankful I have a fully tested fragrance oil that's not going to do anything to really hurt or damage my soap. The consistency is saying beautiful. It's just like a gorgeous cake batter or melted ice cream. It's just lovely. And now I can go ahead and just pour into my mold once I am sure that that fragrance is fully mixed in and that color is mixed in. So I'm gonna look from the side. Everything looks really even. It smells delicious. And here I go. And I'm just gonna pour slowly and gently into my mold, going back and forth for a slightly more even pour. And I don't wanna waste any of my precious soap. So I'm gonna use my spatula just to kind of get all that last little bit of soap out. So now that the soap is done, it does need to sit in the mold for two to three days. And then after that, it's time to unmold. And the way you figure out if you can unmold is you pull gently away from the sides of the mold. And then if it starts to pull away easily and cleanly, you can pull that soap out and get ready to cut it and let it sit for four to six weeks before giving it away or using it yourself. Most of the saponification reaction actually starts right during, right now it's actually about 97% saponified. But you know what, that last 3%, the part that makes it the most gentle, 
that's the part that takes the four to six weeks. And so you're not only evaporating out the extra liquid, meaning that water that was the carrier for the lye, but you're making sure that you have the most gentle, most skin loving, most skin conditioning and safe bar of soap you can by letting it sit for four to six weeks in a well ventilated area. So once you're done with your soap making process, all you need to do is clean up. Now some soap makers just let all their dirty dishes just turn into soap, right? It just takes a couple days, turns into soap, it's pretty easy to wash out. If you're like me though and you need your dishes sooner, I just wipe out all of the kind of greasy, fresh soap out of the container and then just dunk the entire thing in some really, really, really hot water and some grease cutting detergent soap. So be thinking like a Dawn type dishwashing detergent soap and that will help you get all of your dishes clean easily. It might be tempting to put this into a dishwasher. You don't wanna do that. You'll get excess suds and all of this oil. Your dishwasher is really not meant to handle that. Thanks so much for watching. I hope this inspired you to make your very first or second or third batch of soap. We have so many more videos right here at this channel or at brambleberry.com. We have an entire section called In the Studio with lots of free recipes, tips, and tricks. I can't wait to see what you create. When you post it on social media, hashtag it Bramble on so you can inspire me and everyone that watches this channel. Until next time, happy soaping. So we have a question here from YouTube. Uh, Robert D asked, will storing it, and he's referring to soap, in a hot room do anything to it? Melt it, degrade it, et cetera. Oh my goodness, I'm so glad you asked. That's a great question. The answer is yes. So when you are curing your soap in that very important four to six week window, you want to keep it in a cool, dry environment that's not too humid and definitely not too warm. It's just like any delicate, say, cooking product. You keep it in the refrigerator often. Same exact concept when you're curing your soap. Now, once your soap is fully cured and all that excess oil is out and all the oil has been turned into soap, the temperature is a little less concerning, but that first four to six weeks, make sure you are turning your soap every four to, four to six days to ensure that you get good airflow. And yeah, make sure it's in a cool environment that has good airflow.